Fewer than 50% of couples describe any particular sexual interaction as being mutually satisfying. Well, why is that? Okay, the first reason is ignorance. All right, most people know very little about sex and much of what they know is wrong. Now, I tried to bring up my children with a good sex education. And um, I was once challenged, even as my role as sex therapist, sometimes I can get embarrassed. And this is a situation in where I got embarrassed. I've been teaching the medical students about contraception. I was in my study, my briefcase was open on the floor, and it was full of condoms. Now, my sons were five and seven. They were dressed up after their bath in their Mr. Men jammies, right? And they came in together, quietly, they just drifted in. And the older one, Ross, said, Mummy, what, what's, what are those? And I said, oh, they're condoms. And he said, what are those for? And I thought, well, this is a good opportunity. I tell my patients and, uh, and people that they should seize the opportunity when it comes up. And I said, well, that's something that you put over your penis to protect it and to stop from having babies. And he said, could I have a look, right? So I said, yes, fine, have a look. So I picked it up, all right, and he opened it, and he felt it, and he smelt it, all right? And then he said to me, to my horror, can I try it on? <laughs> Well, the blush spread from my toes all the way through my body, but I thought to myself, look, in 10 years' time, I'm going to be telling this kid to wear a condom, here I, and here I am feeling embarrassed. And I said, sure, go ahead. So he pulled down his little Mr. Men jammies and he put his little dick in this condom, and he looked up at me rather pathetically and said, Mummy, it's not a very good fit. <laughs> And I said to him, darling, I was able to go back into doctor mode, darling, as you get bigger, your bones will get bigger, your muscles will get bigger, and your penis will get bigger too. Now, at this point, Stephen, who was five, hadn't said a word, but he nudged his brother and said in a deep, macho voice, hey, Ross, give it to me. It'll probably fit me. <laughs> Now, I bet none of you had a sex education like that. Right? If you were lucky, you might have had some sex ed, ed at school. If you were lucky, your parents might have given you the birds and bees talk. But most people are very ignorant about sex. And as a result, they have unrealistic expectations. Now, where do our unrealistic expectations come from? They come from the media. All right? We are absolutely bombarded with media messages about how sex should be. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Differences between men and women, and I'm going to be talking about that as well, and relationship disruption. Now, where did you get your sex education? All right, was it at home, was it at school, or did you get none? And most people get their sex education from the media, okay? Now, the media presents the fantasy man, all right? This is the fantasy model of sex. He's like James Bond. He's suave, he's sophisticated. Women just take one look at him and their panties fall down, <laughs> all right? He's, an, he's a sex machine, all right? He can do it anywhere, any place, any time. He can do it if he doesn't want to. He can do it if he doesn't like the woman. He can even do it if he doesn't know the woman, all right? And of course, he has this incredible equipment. <laughs> It's a metre long, it's hard as steel, it goes all night, right? It's amazing, all right. And my husband doesn't mind me using this photo of him. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your fantasy man. Now, we get these ideas from movies, from television, from print media, but especially from pornography. Pornography gives a very unrealistic view of what sex is like. So people are disappointed, all right? Um, the fantasy woman, all right? What is she portrayed as? A sexually insatiable Barbie doll. She's hot, she's horny, she's man-hungry, she's a nymphomaniac with a speech defect, <laughs> right? She can't say no, right? She's sex-starved, she's on the prowl all the time, and she has battery syndrome. That means she's ever ready for sex. <laughs> And then, of course, there's fantasy intercourse, <laughs> all right? Now, this is an Olympic event, 
all right, with everybody going for gold on all occasions. They're moaning, they're groaning, they're humping, they're pumping, they're panting, they're sweating. They change positions 25 times. This goes on for hours and hours and hours. Actually, it reminds me of a story about a couple who uh, was, it was their, let me see, 40th wedding anniversary. Right, they'd been married for 40 years. And they went to the same restaurant for dinner that they went to on their first date. And um, they're having dinner and he looks across at her and he says to her, darling, do you remember what we did the first time we came to this restaurant? And she giggled and she said, yes, I do. She said, how could I forget? You took me out the back, you pulled down my pants, you pulled up my dress, you put me up against the fence and you made passionate love to me. And he said, would you like to do that again tonight? And she said, I'd love to. So out they went, out the back. Her dress is up, her pants are down, his pants are down, and they're going at it hammer and tongs, right? Now, the manager has noticed that they have crept outside and he follows them. And he is treated to a display of sexual activity that he has never even imagined in his, in his dreams. Right? They're moaning, they're groaning, they're humping, they're pumping, they're panting, they're sweating. They're doing this over and over and over again for about 15 minutes until they fall completely exhausted on the ground by the fence. And the manager goes up to the gentleman who's lying semi-conscious on the floor <laughs> and says, man, that was incredible. He said, what is your secret? And the old guy looks up and says, Last time we did that, the fence wasn't electrified. <laughs> OK, so fantasy intercourse, of course, right, leads to orgasm for both. All right? And not only just an orgasm, but a G-spot orgasm, female ejaculation, multiple orgasms over and over and over again all night. But the reality about female orgasm is very different. Only 30% of women can have an orgasm through intercourse alone. Why? Because the penis goes in and out here and the clitoris, which is the seat of female orgasm, is up here. For 70% of women, that's not enough stimulation of the clitoris to bring them to orgasm. Now, 40% of women need some kind of direct clitoral stimulation to reach orgasm. Now, that might be manual stimulation, oral stimulation, it might be vibrator stimulation, it might be frottage. Now, frottage is a nice French word. It is not fromage, which is cheese. <laughs> I don't want any confusion here. But frottage basically means to hump your partner. But frottage sounds so much nicer, don't you think? <laughs> Actually, I had a, a, a bikey come in and see me and I was trying to talk to him. This is, I'm talking here about outer course, all right? Intercourse is when you do this, outer course is everything else. And I was describing outer course to him and I described, described frottage and he said to me, Dr. Rosie, he said, you mean a dry root? <laughs> and I said, Frottage sounds so much nicer. Please. All right. So manual stimulation, oral stimulation, vibrator stimulation, frottage. The manual stimulation may be given by the man, but it may need to be given by the woman. And it may be before intercourse, during intercourse, after intercourse, or instead of intercourse. That is the biggest group of women. Right? If you fall into that group, then you're in the majority group. And finally, 30% of women never or rarely have an orgasm in the presence of a partner. And that's because most of them are waiting to have an orgasm through intercourse. Right? And it just isn't going to happen.